And now I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Catherine Peel from the University College Cardiff. I think if I just press F5 to get your slides there and your clicker is that one. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. Is this working? Yeah, you can hear me. Hi, um, yep. so my name is Catherine Peel. I'm um, an adult neurologist um, based in Cardiff. Um, so I've been asked to talk um, a little bit about non-motor symptoms um, in dystonia, and that's because um, in Cardiff we have a very active research um, interest uh, in this area. So as a disclaimer, I'm going to uh, shamelessly um, advertise our research and try and get you involved. And just to note, these are just uh, two photos of Cardiff on our sort of one sunny day of the year. So um, these are the research um, institutes that, uh, that I work in. So I was going to start with what, um, what are non-motor symptoms, because often people will talk about non-motor symptoms, but in very general terms, and I think non-motor means different things to different people. Um, so from a research perspective and from an understanding of dystonia perspective, um, these are the areas that we tend to focus on. I'm not saying that these are the only areas, but, but this is where, where we focus. So um, first of all, psychiatric symptoms, this is something um, that we've had a long-standing interest in, and and I'm going to come back to a little bit later. Um, next is cognition. So by that, I don't mean um, memory tests as such, or you know, can you remember a list of 10 items or something like that. More to do with how people process information, so how people go about um, planning, so planning an activity, planning to go on holiday, that sort of thing. It's that information processing technique. Sleep, all of us like a good, good amount of sleep, but um, often we hear from, uh, from our patients with dystonia that there's disturbances to sleep. Um, and so we're working to try and better understand that. And then last of all, and Francesca um, touched on this a little bit, um, pain. And, and I'll talk a little bit about how we're approaching that. So as I said, um, we um, and many others have had a long-standing interest in psychiatric symptoms um, in dystonia. And there's lots of published papers um, in this area that date back probably a couple of decades now. And um, there has been, relative to the other symptoms, a disproportionate focus on psychiatric symptoms. And some of that is historical, because um, many of you may know that uh, probably pre the late 70s, so in the era of um, David Marsden uh, and Stanley Farn, people thought dystonia was a functional disorder. It, it wasn't a, a neurological disorder. And um, often people were sent to see psychiatrists rather than to see neurologists. And so um, I think a lot of that has then carried through. And so there was a lot of focus, um, or there has been a lot of focus on psychiatric symptoms. Um, but we've also, um, I work mainly with psychiatrists um, in terms of, uh, from a research perspective, and um, we've sought to focus on certain types of dystonia, so rare dystonias that are caused by specific genes. Um, so these are very small groups of people, but it allows us to ask some very um, specific questions. And this... Um, next graph is very busy, but the only bars that are of any interest are the red one and the aqua blue color one. Um, and this um, first bit here just looks at when we were doing questionnaires, just asking people different questions, asking people if they had any psychiatric symptoms at all. And the red bar um, is a condition known as myoclonus dystonia, and the turquoise bar is um, dystonic tremor. And compared um, to the other two bars you can see who are people without dystonia, um, there's a much higher overall um, level of symptoms. But we, you know, saying that is, is one thing. What we were really interested in is the type of symptoms that people have. So um, moving along that, um, that graph to the areas where the, the red bar and the turquoise bar are high, um, this is generalized anxiety disorder. So general symptoms of anxiety and another area that we've been particularly interested in um, is obsessive compulsive disorder, particularly in relation to this specific sort of dystonia, so myoclonus dystonia. But you know, these symptoms are quite varied, and so we were um, very keen to find out which bits, particularly, say, within the obsessive compulsive disorder, were particularly interesting. So um, obsessive compulsive disorder is made up of two bits. So obsession, so these are when um, you keep thinking about things, things keep coming into your head, you can't get them out of your head, and they keep going round and round and round. Whereas the compulsions are things like um, hand washing or ordering things. So I saw a, a child as a part of this study um, that had 
I don't know, 20 or 30 soft toys on their bed. And they lined them up every night according to size and color. And they wouldn't go to bed and they wouldn't go to sleep until all of these toys were lined up. And so that would be more of a, a compulsive type behavior. So we found that in this group, although OCD was high, it wasn't the obsessions. People weren't concerned with these intrusive thoughts. It was these compulsions to doing things. And asking these questions and, and trying to understand these symptoms um, are really important in terms of trying to understand why they're happening. So we've moved a little bit away from that now, um, and particularly me as an adult neurologist interested in the adult um, onset and the, and the focal dystonias, and really trying to get a better picture of what the whole disorder um, consists of. So not just the motor component, but a real understanding of the non-motor component. And it's our belief that people don't neatly fall into, into categories. So there may be some person who or an individual who has um, very severe cervical dystonia, so very severe motor symptoms. They then may have very little anxiety, but they have a lot of sleep disturbance and a lot of pain. And those patients will be very different from, a, from someone who has, say, blepharospasm, maybe a lot of anxiety, no pain, and no sleep disturbance. So it's about understanding that whole spectrum of symptoms and putting them together um, is really important to us. And for us, um, from, a, from a research perspective, the reason why this is really important is because we want to try and understand why dystonia happens. And uh, our feeling is until we understand what symptoms the disease causes, then we can start to understand why, why it might happen. And then the nirvana for all of us in this room is, is to be able to develop personalized medicine. So it's specific to you. It's not a generic treatment that we have something that's specific for you. So in terms of our, our non-motor study, um, we looked at all the symptoms that I've described before, um, but also um, quality of life. And this is an ongoing um, piece of work that we're doing at the moment. So we recruit now, not just in Wales, um, but at several centres now in England. And we've got two branches, because obviously travelling to Cardiff is, is a long way for most people. So we have um, some very detailed um, studies for people that are able to travel to Cardiff, but we also have um, this more distant data collection, and we've set up a website, um, and this will be on, um, this uh, website address will be on the last page as well, um, that's just a series of questions that go through all these non-motor symptoms um, that people can log in, you can do the consent online, you can answer all of these questions online, um, and it takes about 45 minutes. Um, and that's just a, um, a screenshot of our website. It's, it's all very straightforward. Um, and then for people who are able to come to Cardiff, then we do, do things in a bit more detail. But our rough breakdown of, of questionnaires, we still have a lot of focus on psychiatric symptoms, but we're very interested in pain, um, in sleep, in this information processing, um, but also how these impact on people's qualities of life. So I wanted, um, we've done some interim analysis. We've got a couple of hundred people who are already part of the study at the moment. And I wanted to, to give you just a flavor, not really complicated statistics or anything like that, but just a flavor of some of the results that we're getting out at the moment. So in terms of looking at psychiatric symptoms, I've only looked very broadly here. Um, so first of all, depression. So for all of these bar bars, it's all, I'm sure you can see for yourselves, all pretty self-explanatory, but the black bar is dystonia and the blue bar are um, people who are deemed to be healthy controls, whatever healthy, healthy means, but essentially people who don't have dystonia. And for people who are very interested in statistics, I've put um, p-values at the bottom um, so you can see how, how, uh, um, how bit great the, the increased level is then in terms of the dystonia patients. So we've got higher levels of depression. We also see even higher levels of anxiety amongst, this is across all, sort, all types of dystonia. Um, and uh, we do this through a number of questionnaires. When we drill down into that in a little bit more detail as to what types of anxiety people have, uh, people describe um, social setting anxiety. So going out into, into a social setting, uh, people they don't know, an environment that they're unfamiliar with, that's when they get their, their most severe symptoms of anxiety. When we look at sleep, so we um, have had huge problems trying to find good questionnaires uh, about sleep for people with dystonia, but overall um, there's a high level of sleep disturbance amongst people with dystonia. And Francesca's also um, alluded to the pain, particularly in cervical dystonia, and so while we do ask for pain, what we're interested in is how people um, deal with pain 
or what pain means to people, because pain is very different to different people. So what I may think is really severe pain, some of you may think is absolutely nothing and you know, really not even worth a paracetamol. So our perception of pain is very different. And so what we've looked at is how people, their acceptance towards pain, what their processing of pain is like um, and how they deal with pain. So I'm cu coming to the end. Um, so just to say that these, again, are the four areas that we're really focusing on and really to try and get a better understanding so that, um, of what dystonia and the different types of dystonia, what that really looks like for people. These are all the people that I work with um, and have to thank, but thank you very much for, for your time. Do you want to stay there or do you want to sit there? Yeah. Oh. So again, it's the same drill, actually. Anybody have any questions? Please raise your hand and then people will come around with the microphone. Um, no? Just in case someone's thinking of a question, just to have a plug for this study, we're, um, a big part of doing work like this is understanding how people without dystonia would also um, feel about answering these questions and that sort of thing. So if you're a family member, a carer, or a relative who would also like to take part, you're also very welcome to take part. It's exactly <laughs> the same study questions. Thank you. I have, oh no, there is a lady there. If we can just bring the microphone over. Just a very simple question. Um, you did, you know, sort of depression of someone with dystonia against a control. Have you ever done um, a comparison of someone with dystonia and then somebody with pain but not dystonia? Um, because the reason I'm thinking is, you know, like pain would make you depressed. The other question really is related to that. And you were saying about obsession. And in dystonia, one of the main problems is you have lack of control. So therefore, to be obsessed to try and control something might be something you know, related to dystonia? So those are very good questions. So trying to, um, a lot of our research is trying to control for as many different factors as possible. And so that argument um, is made not just for dystonia, but for lots of medical conditions. Do you see things like depression and anxiety because of, rather than as part of the condition and trying to tease that out? So we have a number um, of different other disease groups that we compare to. Um, one of the ones we compare to are people with hemifacial spasm who also come to our Botox clinics as well. They don't have as much pain as, as such, um, but also an arthritis group. So, so it, it's slightly different, but that is, that's one of the very difficult questions that we have to try and answer. In terms of the obsessions, um, we don't see really a, an excess or a higher level of obsessions across the board in dystonia. It's just in that one very specific um, group. So when we do the OCD scores uh, for people with cervical dystonia for, uh, with controls, we don't, we don't see a huge, a huge amount of difference. Okay. 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 Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you.